Fire with Style. I'm Wade. I'm joined by my trusty co-host, Alex. And we're both joined today by our trusty regular guest star and <laughs> presenter and uh, what is it? The announcer for the show as well, Bob French. And welcome back to the show, Bob. Well, thanks for having me back. And I don't is know Bob if you guys have any small... <laughs> Yes. <God. laughs> He's got that booming <laughs> radio voice to do the intros. But we are continuing with our discussion of inflation in this episode. I did mention at the end of the previous episode, we'd be talking about the retirement styles. Uh, but then we realized there's actually a lot more to talk about before we even get to going through the styles. So we may ultimately save that for the next episode as well. But what we do want to spend more time talking about in this episode is we began the discussion of tips and I bonds, and particularly tips in this context, and started talking about whether you hold those in a mutual fund or whether you ladder those into a retirement income bond ladder. And so it's probably worth exploring more about that specific topic. And then we also have annuities on the agenda and, and the role annuities play in this whole inflation conversation as well. So I think that's going to be a, a good agenda for this particular yeah. episode. Okay, Wade, that's great. I, 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 I will say. <laughs> Thank you. Alex. Bob, were you? Yeah, you're welcome. Glad you approved. Did you? Yeah, it's good. It's good. Let's, <laughs> let's proceed. Let's proceed. But Bob, did you notice how Wade did all of this? We 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 just you know we 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 kind of batched some of these episodes, and we so we just recorded one. I don't know, like giving away the secrets. five minutes ago. Nah, nah, everyone knows that. But what was interesting? Did you see how Wade did these push-ups in between in between he episodes? Did. It was very and, impressive. And he, he he did another. He did like twelve, and he his his voice didn't. He was perfect. Yeah. Not out of breath. Nothing when he did this intro. Yeah. You're on your way, Wade. You're on your way. Yeah, just you wait. (laughs) Just you wait. (laughs) Alexander Hamilton, everybody. Gonna have to get a new wardrobe. (laughs) Yeah, that that shirt's looking a little tight, man. You're right. Now that you say that, that shirt's looking a little tight on you, especially around the pecs. (laughs) (laughs) All right. All right. So, tips ladder. Carry on, Bob. There we go. Um, Yeah, with. You know, we started the conversation, as as Wade said uh, last week, around, you know, the different approaches that you can be using to deal with inflation. So the first one was investing and, you know, not hedging per se, just outgrowing, it. you know, being able to support those inflation adjustments in your distribution strategy because, you know, your expected return from your portfolio is higher than inflation um, and you're just able to pay for that. Now we're starting to get into more of the reliable income. Now we're starting to get into, well, how do you match inflation? How do you actually set it up so that you're going to have this specific amount of income to deal with whatever happens with inflation? And, you know, the first place that makes sense in that reliable income bucket to you know be looking at are tips, which are explicitly well, me- designed. But let me stop you there. The first place we did talk about it in the last episode, and it's worth just remembering, is Social Security. Social, yes. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Especially within that reliable income bucket. Social Security, worth pointing out, you know, that covers for the vast majority of folks a massive chunk of their retirement income spending. And it's by its nature, inflation adjusted. So that's on the table already, that's kind of table stakes, if you will. What we're talking about now Mm -hmm. is the stuff above and beyond Social Security. How do we ensure that we're gonna have, you know, real spending power here, that we're not going to lose our spending power through time while still using reliable income sources? So let's talk about tips. So tips are treasury inflation protected securities. They are treasury bonds, that have inflation protection built in. So what is it, every six months, the treasury goes in, adjusts the principal on there. Uh, And that means when they pay out, when they mature, you get a bigger payment. And also the coupons that come off of those, because they're adjusting that principal, those coupons are inflation adjusted. So you get more over time as well. So tips can be a really, really solid way of building a ladder. And, you know, one of the things with, you know, when we think about building a bond ladder, 
what we're really doing is we're saying, I'm locking in this income, you know, you know, absent me wanting to go out and sell these bonds, these individual bonds that I'm holding. I know how much money I'm going to get at each point in time. I know what the coupons are going to be. I know what the principal payments are going to be. And I'm just going to get that, you know, ab- assuming the U.S. government doesn't default or whoever the bond issuer is doesn't default. And they should be incredibly highly rated bonds if they're not U.S. treasuries for, for those of us living in the U.S. Um, you know, I, I know what I'm going to get. With tips, the statement is basically the same, but not exactly. Because the statement is, I know how much purchasing power I'm going to get. I don't necessarily know the dollar value, you know, with a traditional, with a nominal treasury bond. I know the check I'm going to get. I know what that dollar value is going to be. With tips, I don't know what that dollar value is going to be, but I know how much I'll be able to buy with it. And that's really what we want to focus on here. Um, From a mechanic standpoint, yeah, it's the same thing. You're, You're buying tips rather than a treasury bond. You're, you're doing the same thing. Uh, the quotes are a little bit more complicated with tips because of that inflation adjustment, but that's neither here nor there for this conversation. Uh, if you really want to get into it, we actually have a workshop in the Retirement Researcher Academy that, uh, that gets to the mechanics of building out a bond ladder. Um, so we don't need to go through all the math here, but you know, you're just building a ladder that happens to be with tips. But one of the really important things here is, you know, it's got all the same advantages and disadvantages of, you know, a, any sort of bond ladder. You know, they are more expensive than if you were to buy an equivalent annuity um, that's paying out the same amount because you don't have those mortality credits effectively. But at the same time, you have a lot more flexibility. You, know, you can do all these things. You know, your plan Z is... I can go sell these bonds. They are marketable securities. Uh, You know, if everything else is blowing up and you need that money, it's not hard to go sell a treasury bond. Uh, It might not be the best thing for your plan, but if we're already at that point, bad things have been happening already. Bob, you said it correctly, but I maybe worth clarifying. You said that bonds are more expensive than annuities. Yeah. And someone listening Usually. might say, wait a second, I thought you could basically get bonds, treasuries without any sort of markup, whereas annuities have all these fees baked in. So that's not what you're referencing. It's how much assets do you need to meet a goal? It's exactly. going to take more assets to meet a spending goal with bonds than with an annuity. And, and yeah. that's the right context to think about things. But I just wanted to point yeah. that There's out. There's always a little bit of an empirical <laughs> question there because, you know, the insurance companies, they're building in a profit for themselves. So, you know, there might be a rare situation where, yeah, when you go and price things out, it might be a little bit cheaper with a bond than, you know, this particular annuity you're looking at. But as a general statement, you know, because you are buying a, an individual guaranteed payment, the gov- if we're looking at treasury bonds, the government will be paying out all of this money you know, that tends to be more expensive than buying into an annuity where, you know, they're baking in the fact that, you know, some people are not going to be living quite as long. There are those, you know, mortality credits where you you get a little bit extra, um, assuming you live longer. There's also, talking about bond ladders, uh, the issue that, well, bonds, U.S. Treasuries doesn't sell bonds longer than 30 years. Most people's retirement, uh, at least want to assume that their retirement is going to be longer than 30 years. So you have to kind of square that circle a little bit and deal with, well, what happens after 30 years? There's certain definitely, definitely some things to be thinking about there. But one of the things I want to kind of impress here is that if you go back two weeks when we were talking about kind of inflation expectations, that when you go and buy or build, I should say, a tips ladder or a bond ladder, a nominal bond ladder, the expectation, if I put in the same amount of money to both, the expectation would be I'm going to get the same amount of money out. 
because you know I may have a lower yield on the tips ladder, but I'm going to have that inflation adjustment built in. So that's definitely one thing to call out. The difference is going to be how does inflation actually turn out over the length of that ladder? Um, and that's something that I think a lot of people get really hung up on and they worry about, you know, do I win or do I lose? You know, was inflation, you know, if inflation was higher, the people who bought the tips ladder won. you know, they get more money. You know, if inflation is lower than expectations, well, then the people who bought that tips ladder lost. They got less money. You know, Wade, as you were getting to, um, you know, I forget who, whether it was you or, or Alex, was getting to about, you know, holding these things to maturity. Once you've made that decision, you don't care about the market price anymore. You know, when you're buying a tips ladder, you're saying, I am buying this spending. I am buying this spending power. That's a good and phrase. It's going to be whatever it is. That's a good phrase. Yeah, man. and also just to the point too. So if to the extent that you're trying to fund a spending need that may grow with inflation as a risk management strategy, the tips, you're more exposed or you're more vulnerable to high inflation than to low inflation. And so the tips yep. will help manage that risk better. So like with that Absolutely. investment calculation of it, well, if inflation is high, tips will outperform. If inflation is low, regular treasuries will outperform. Well, that's an investing context in a retirement income context. If my spending need grows with inflation, I'm hedging that inflation risk with the tips, even if they end yep. up underperforming treasuries because inflation is really low. I was protecting myself against the risk of high inflation through the exactly. tips. Exactly. The, so the cost of underperforming inflation, the cost of, you know, inflation being higher uh, for a retiree is, you know, not good. It's not a, not a good thing uh, as a lot of people have been experiencing lately. So, you know, we're, you know, I'm saying this very broadly and generally, but retirees generally should be willing to pay a little bit, uh, you know, to take that risk off the table. It's a valuable thing. Um, and, you know, that's definitely something to be considering in, as part of this conversation. So, um, yeah, not too much more to say about tips ladders. Uh, they're, they're a thing. Uh, you know, the other thing I'll call out, it doesn't need to be all or nothing. Um, you know, if you're someone who is in that time segmentation bucket or just generally looking at a tips ladder, or any sort of bond ladder. It doesn't have to be all tips or all treasuries or all nominal bonds. You can do both. Um, you know, assuming that we're talking about, you know, treasury bonds, which are insanely and very highly liquid, you know, it's not that big a deal to own, well, two bonds for every year. Probably wouldn't stack them, you know, one year is a tips, one year is a, you know, a nominal bond because that's going to lead to some really it. weird cash flows. Um, but you know, you can own both of them in any year mm -hmm. and kind of hedge your hedging, if you will. And then a real quick 30 second intro, if anyone's just kind of wondering, how do you create a bond letter? And, and Bob, as you mentioned, we've done workshops on that at the retirement researcher Academy, but the, the basic idea is you start at the end. So say I want to build a 20 year tips ladder. I look at how much of the 20 year maturity tips do I need to buy to meet that spending obligation 20 years from now? And then that's gonna include coupon payments. So then I go back to year 19. I say, well, after I get the coupon payment from the year 20 bond, how much more do I need? I buy that face value. Then I go to year 18. Now I've got coupon payments for years 19 and 20 coming in. How much of the year 18 maturity do I need to buy? And so on, all the way back to year one. Now with tips, there are some years that don't have maturing tips. And so you're going to have to finagle that a little bit. Uh, what I generally do is <laughs> whatever tips was the most recent tip maturing tip. So like if there's no maturing tips in the year 2028, say. I think it's 2034 20, 20, to 39 is where the whole all is right, right great. Now. You've got that. You've got that top of mind. So tw no tips <laughs> 2034 to 2039. So you're just going to have to buy like six years worth of spending at the 2034 maturity and then figure out how you're going to then spread that out over the yep. next And then years. just hope they start issuing those bonds 
or those tips relatively soon and you can swap them in. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. With the, <laughs> and the other That's thing I'll it, call yeah. out again, uh, for those of you who are Academy members in the tool section, we do have a calculator that will do all that for you. It's not for everyone else. It's not that hard. It's just kind of tedious, uh, to do that math and kind of work your way down. But for those of you who are in the Academy, we've got something there for you to do, to do that. Um, the other thing I want to call out here is I-bonds. We always get yelled at if we don't explicitly talk <laughs> about I-bonds. Um, you know, I-bonds, they're not exactly on point to a bond ladder conversation because there's no, there's no actual maturity date. You have to hold them, you know, I think it's a year. And then, you know, they don't accrue any more, uh, any more money after I think it's 30 years. But, you know, within that window, they're still going to be growing and you can pull money out. So it's you can kind of think of it as somewhere between your investment portfolio, especially because I bonds. Everyone was incredibly excited about them, you know, a year or two ago when they were paying really, really high rates. But that's because it's a variable rate. You know, it's it's back down to earth. I don't know what it's paying exactly right now, but, you know, in line with inflation which is why they were paying such high rates uh, in the recent past. It's also, but you can go it's, through. It's also, it's a good problem to have, but there, there's also yeah. limits on it too, right? There yeah. are. 10,000 10, um, 10, 10, for it's, social security yeah. number. Uh, you can you get up to $5,000 your... of a, a, a tax refund. So yeah. for a couple who's taking full advantage of all this, you could be getting $25,000 a year. And then if you started at age 36 and bought that $25,000 a year for the next 30 years, when you get to 65, you now have a 30 year bond ladder coming in for uh, yeah. 25,000. I mean, I, mean I, I get that, but at some my, point my they may have to that. adjust the caps, but $25,000 a year inflation adjusted my, for 30 years. Maybe I'm misguided, but my only issue with that is that if I'm 35 and I'm like buying bonds right now, so I can like, take money out when I'm 65, that's a long time to, to hold money in fixed income while you're in the, I, I, I guess there you to me. You get tax deferral also. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm just, just like, if, I, I'm too market centric for that yeah, particular you might, one. You know? Depending on your risk tolerance, you got to make sure that if you're doing this, it's not giving you too big of waiting to fixed income for sure. Yeah. No. And, and you know, there, there's also the issue that it's not, going to be paying a specific amount like a bond or a tip, um, you know, it is a variable rate. You know, it's going to be effectively a pool of money that you can be pulling from. So it's it's actually tending more towards the risky asset side, uh, or at least conceptually, it's tending more towards pulling from an investment portfolio to a certain extent. Um, so, you know, definitely something that can be a useful tool but, you know, it might not be exactly on point if you're wanting to lock in, you know, with tips, a certain amount of spending power, uh, you know, as opposed to I want to be able to pull out a certain amount of money there. So I, I think at that point, Wade, why don't we kind of transition here into talking about the annuities? Because this is actually a, a, an interesting conversation, you know, currently there are no income annuities out there that have inflation adjustment. You know, they, they will pay you a set amount, but they will not adjust that set amount based on what inflation does. Yeah. Yeah. And to clarify, there are income annuities with cost of living adjustments. So you can get a fixed 2% growth or a fixed 3% growth. It's not true inflation protection, but it's something in the past, there have been providers that offered CPI adjusted income annuities. Uh, the last company in that market dropped out in January 2020. And so since January 2020, there is no CPI adjusted income annuities. And it's kind of a pity, but I, I guess no one was buying them when they existed. I <laughs> was talking with a, a New York Life report. I think Jeff Summer, he, he wrote a story in the New York Times. He tracked down like the one person that a major a uh, seller of income annuities <laughs> who bu actually bought an inflation adjusted income annuity. And it was wait, a retired wait, wait, actuary wait, wait. in Arizona. Ida May Fuller, Ida May Fuller. 
Was it Ida No, she's the first social security no. recipient. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Good job. <laughs> no, a retired actuary in Arizona was the only person uh, that one of course it was an ever sold an inflation adjusted income annuity to. So they weren't popular. And I think part of the reason is just behaviorally the, because you're going to get inflation adjustments, you're backloading the income. So mm -hmm. they give a lower initial payout rate and people tend to latch on whatever gives the highest initial payout rate which is a nominal annuity gives you more today. It's just not inflation adjusted. Yeah. So they were not popular and income and annuities in general, of course, are not popular. They're a small minority under 10% of all annuity sales, but um, that's the situation. There's no inflation protected income annuities today. So, so what do you do? You know, if you so want inflation you adjusted oh, income but, and you want again, annuities, but look, the long-term average of inflation is what was it, two nine or what, whatever number you said before, right? In the somewhere between two and three. Yeah. And you're getting a cola. You can pick a colas between two and three. I think it's good enough, to be honest with you. Yeah. There's, you know, there's definitely in a normal year, um, you know, the you can buy those riders that get you, you know, as Wade said, two or a three percent increase in your premium every year. Um, no matter what happens, the problem is, you know, if we have situations like 2021 and 2022, where inflation was about 9% for both by of those the Costco years. brand for those years, I mean, you'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. We're well, done. There's a, start doing, there's a start doing Kirkland that... signature. Start buying Kirkland no, signature. Alex, you'll be fine. Go on. There's an inflation, a, a sequence of inflation risk. If in year one of retirement, the price level goes up 10%. And then the rest of the, your retirement, it's 0% inflation. You're still, your retirement's permanently now 10% more expensive. Than even if you buy Costco, ones. even if you buy Costco. Yes. Even if you buy it's like rotisserie. Have you so. had that rotisserie chicken? It's like very it cheap. Pretty good. <laughs> and the hot dogs haven't gone up in like years. So you Since better double check your math, Wade. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, I mean, yes, there, you, you can get a lot forward. of the way. Uh, along that way or along towards inflation protection by getting that flat 2% adjustment. Um, but it, it's not quite the same thing. And, and that's an important point here, though, because as Wade's talking about, there is that sequence of returns risk. You know, if, if you were someone who, you know, shoot, you know, the pandemic was not kind to your career uh, and you were right on that cusp of retiring, decided to retire, well, that inflation is going to carry its effects the rest of your life. Um, and having some sort of real inflation protection matters to those people, matters to all of us. Um, it is a very specific risk that, you know, there are ways of adjusting for. Um, and you know, Wade, I mean, you can, you can elaborate on this a lot more than I can, but you know, one of the big ways is kind of a stepwise approach with annuities or an annuity ladder. You know, there's a, a number of different ways of, of describing this, but, you know, effectively what it is, is you just have, hey, I've got my base annuity, uh, you know, the one that I'm starting retirement with that's paying, you know, the bulk of what I want, but then you bring in other annuities that start once you start kind of feeling the bite of inflation there to top yourself back up. And there's a couple of different ways of accomplishing this, but that's the basic idea here. That's, you know, if you're someone who really wants to know, you know, in a all but metaphysical sense where your money is coming from, you know, if you want it coming from those income type annuities, yeah, that's one way to do it here. You know, Wade, do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, yeah, just on that point in and of itself, right, the idea is, well, get the annuity income that you want to have covered today. Over time, inflation will eat away at the purchasing power of that annuity income. Uh, but then the other point of this as well is what we do experience. And when you look at like David Blanchett's retirement spending smile and so forth, a lot of retirees, their spending needs do not increase completely with inflation. They may lag behind inflation to some degree, like 1% less in inflation every year or something like that. And in that context, you might find over time, 
even though the purchasing power from your annuity is not keeping up with inflation, it may still be enough. And that when you you have social security as well, that is inflation adjusted. So maybe the blend of social security and your fixed annuity, it's never the case that you need to buy more, but you have the flexibility and the option that if you're getting to the point of, okay, now that there's been some inflation, I really wish I had more reliable income that could purchase more goods and services at today's prices, then I can go ahead and, and ladder in an additional purchase and replenish that reliable income to get it up to a level that I'm more comfortable with. And so that's the, the laddering approach. Keep the optionality to buy annuities in the future uh, and then make the decision about whether or not you need to do so. It's definitely the, the way to think about it. Absolutely. Now, now, the other big aspect of this is annuities in and of themselves aren't intended to provide the inflation protection, especially no CPI adjusted annuity. But it's what do they do for your other assets that may allow your other assets to be the source of inflation protection? And that's really the way I look at it. Like we, this idea of sequence of returns risk, if I'm spending from a portfolio and there's a market downturn, I, I can dig a hole for myself. Well, if I can lower the distribution rate from my portfolio, that makes it easier for my portfolio to grow. And so with the annuity, if I'm replacing some of my bonds with protected lifetime income, I'm going to have more of my spending need covered in the future through the annuity than I could through bonds. That's going to put less pressure on distributions from my other investments. And then going back to what we talked about last week with this idea that hopefully stocks are going to outperform inflation over reasonable holding periods. Well, if I'm reducing the distribution pressures on those investments, I'm making it all the much easier for those other investments to grow mm -hmm. and to provide the source of inflation of protection that the annuity is not designed to do. It's making it easier I, for other assets to do that. It's not doing I it. I think that's, that's a very important point. And that's why I was kind of like pushing back on the COLA part where it's like, listen, it's good enough. It's not like you need to, every single thing you hold has to be a perfect mm -hmm. like annuity hedge. I mean, Bob likes to use the phrase a slug, right? If you have a good slug of stuff that helps you against inflation, a good slug of stuff that is going to outrun inflation, you're fine. I mean, I, I wouldn't get this precise sort of craziness of trying to line everything up because you're right, Wade. You're not going to spend, you're spending over, you know, between the age of, I don't know, whatever it is, 65 through 95. It's not going to perfectly track inflation anyways. It's probably going to be less. So, you know, you know, there's no sense to have no. this undue anxiety over trying to perfectly match everything up. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, in, in this is... context, oh, too, I just recently um, a prominent type financial planner who uh, writes for <laughs> the media as well, kind of wrote a critique of one of my articles. And so we had some back and forth <laughs> discussion about it. <laughs> but Ooh, at, at the end, it <laughs> we don't need to get into that part. But okay. it's ultimately, where, where we ended with the discussion is he could never consider an annuity for income because it creates inflation risk. And his argument was... In, uh, you talk about bond duration, like the, the higher the duration of a bond, the kind of in simple terms, the further away its maturity, the more sensitive it is to interest rate risk. If interest rates go up, it has a bigger loss. Well, annuities are very much long duration fixed income assets. So when inflation goes up and it's going to push up interest rates, it's going to reduce the purchasing power of the annuity, or it's going to reduce the, the present value of those future annuity payments. And in that regard, it behaves like a long-term bond. And so he ultimately was kind of, I thought he was more of a, we don't know what the market's going to do, but he ultimately was saying, no, I'm so worried inflation is going to be high in the future. I don't believe the break-evens between treasuries and tips. I only want to hold short-term fixed income. I could never consider an annuity. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, if you model, well, yeah, if inflation is 8% a year, the annuity, what I'm talking about of the annuity is going to work better for you than bonds. I guess at that point, no, you just hold cash and you avoid having that interest rate risk. Uh, so then you just cross your fingers that stocks are going to keep up with that 8% inflation. Yeah, but, but that's not, at some level, yeah, you have I mean, to manage this risk. It's, but it's, I, <laughs> it's yeah, like, goes back have, to point. That's great for him. Uh, you know, we yeah. always talk about what makes you comfortable in your plan. And if he's not comfortable, 
with an annuity or with the expectations of inflation. Cool. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> but there's another conversation to be had there. But I'm just. But what gets me when you're saying that is this is the person. I, I assume he's a, a, a an A level journalist, and you know he's providing advice. But he still can't sort of get out of his own way in terms of his opinions on the market. Mm-hmm. You know, and and that's where I'm like, you can be so smart about the market, but still be unwise about the market, right? It's 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 almost like why does he play that game? You know, or she play that. Why why do they play that game? It, you don't need it. You just saw in the previous episode where Bob was saying a simple vanilla 6040 portfolio does fine against inflation 70% of the time over a 70 year rolling period. Well, 96% what the heck are you, of the time. 96, those, okay, yeah. I, I was doing it from memory. So what what are you worried <laughs> about? You know, like like uh, like why can't that person just like yeah, remove his opinion? From these it becomes an argument for tips, I think, because, or depending on how probability based you are, stocks, but, mm-hmm. but it's either you've got to have tips because you can't trust anything that's not in the fixed income world that's non inflation adjusted, or you're going to trust that stocks will I mean, give you the inflation. At the same addition. time, though, I, if you're that worried about inflation, if you think inflation is going to be doing that, how much do you trust the government to be able to do those inflation adjustments? Once you start going down that road and start mm-hmm. worrying about these catastrophic kind of tail type of risks, uh, all bets kind of have to be off. And, 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 and not only that, Bob, but wait, that person doesn't care that the spread is the market's expectation of inflation. That person is saying, I know more. Yeah, so mm-hmm. it doesn't even matter really at that point. Given the, yeah, the that's that was my beginning. Thing, but... That was my initial. <laughs> that was my initial foray. It was like hubris. Well, you just it's partly you think needed. you know more than the market, but also you could frame it as risk management. It, that's what I was saying earlier. Yeah. If retirees are more vulnerable to risk, I mean to inflation. <laughs> if they're more vulnerable to inflation, you need to make sure you have a plan to manage that inflation risk. But know, when he I, takes I it the further step of saying you can ha- have anything other than short term treasuries or I guess tips in your fixed income portfolio because of this risk of inflation. Yeah, at some level, you're really taking that too far. It would be the argument that I would make. And, and to yeah. the extent that risk pooling through insurance gives you an extra yield over other fixed yeah. income assets, then it's back exactly. to the point I was saying earlier. It makes it easier for your other assets to provide the inflation protection, and it's still giving you a more diversified portfolio in that regard. Yeah, that that person wasn't taking into account. It seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, the household allocation. Okay, fine. You know, even give him the argument for the annuities. But to your point, but if you have an annuity, then you could take more risk on the equity side. So, you know, it's mm-hmm. still net, yeah, yo, that, net plus, that too, right? <laughs> you know, you you're have still more net risk plus. Capacity. So, what do you care? Yeah, but. No, but I want to jump back to the point that kind of got us on that, that you don't need to match up everything perfectly. Um, you know, one of the things that I always think about with retirement planning is just there's, there's so much noise in the system. You know, I, I think about it in terms of significant figures. You know, if you remember like high school or middle school science class, when they're teaching you how to measure these things, you know, if you're a ruler only has, you know, to the 10th of an inch, you don't try and get to the hundredth of an inch. You know, you can only measure as close to, you know, whatever our tools give us the ability. Our tools, you know, they're not bad, um, but there's not much, there's no precision. You know, we, we want to get better than in the ballpark, but not that much better. You know, we want, we have to accept that there's just a lot of slop in our plans, that we're going to have to continuously adjust these things. This course correction is part, it's, exactly. it's course correction. It's not, whoever thinks I got a 30 year plan and I, I've done a million Excels to back it up. It's kind of foolish. It's it's just, you know, it's, it's course correction. Get directionally the right way and then start adjusting along the way. And that's really what it is. I mean, everything else is just, you're wasting your time. Go, go walk walk in the park with your spouse or something like that. It's a better use of your time. Yep. I think. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how much you like them or how much they like you. 
Yeah, so. that's why I said, you know, I, just, I did some hedge. I hedged. There we go. <laughs> Bob, what are you doing after this call? Uh, I don't <laughs> no, know. No, I, I, uh, the weather's great. You want to walk? Take a walk? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're I'm up in Maine and we're recording this uh, right before Hurricane Lee starts getting up to up this way. So um, we're, we're going to see what this turns out to. So. There's a hurricane floating around? Yeah. I really don't follow the news. <laughs> is it supposed wow. to hit DC as well for Alex? Or is no, it's, no idea. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's, <laughs> you guys may get some rain. I don't know. But uh, it's supposed to hit. I think Portland is out of the cone at this point. Um, it's going to be cone. hitting the, the Maritimes up in Canada. Um, but uh, by it's the time be, this episode airs, we it'll be learn, way right? past. Alex's yeah. home was flooded, and <laughs> that's <laughs> right. He just said they're not well, following the weather. I'm from I'm from Miami, right? So I don't I don't like pay attention to to anything that's hurricane related anymore. <laughs> it's not I'm, I'm, it's not worth it. <laughs> yeah, I've been like saturated with that kind of no, no pun intended with those kind of news feeds. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, I don't. Did you buy ice? Please tell me you bought ice. I would love it if you bought ice. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. I'm charging like power bricks and stuff like that, but that's that's the extent. Are you covering your windows with plywood? I, I am not covering my windows. Right. Although we did have our neighbors just did pull down a tree that was dead this afternoon. So that works out. But there you go. Um, but where how do we get there? Where where were we going with that? Oh yeah, whether your spouse likes you or not. So <laughs> But actually living your life in retirement rather than, you know, trying to match up to the thousandth decimal place. Um, you know, all of these minute planning details. Um, and, you know, it's not always possible. No, I, I think mistakes are, make, are made in the fringes. In the beginning yeah. where you have no idea and you're guessing. And at the end where you're trying to give yourself this false sense of precision. I think you make the largest mistakes there. You know, you, you kind of, again, get a healthy slug of everything and see how it goes. Yep. Okay. Now, Bob, on your list, you did have variable annuities as well. We've, we've mostly been talking about income annuities. Right. I don't know if you want to add any color. Yeah, variable is, is obviously a little tougher to talk about because, well, they're they're variable. Um, and even more specifically than that, it's, <laughs> it's incredibly product specific. Um, you know, you can find inflation protection in variable annuities. There, there are inflation riders on, you know, different products out there. Um, there are also ones that, you know, are fixed in all but name, um, you know, but the inherent underlying logic is going to be pretty darn similar. Um, you know, there's, and, and this really gets into when we start talking through the different RISA quadrants you know, the different ways that especially folks in the risk wrap quadrant are going to be dealing with this type of stuff. But, you know, variable annuities can be a way to give you a little bit more inflation protection than, you know, an income annuity simply because, well, there's an underlying investment in most, if not all of those variable annuities and how underlying may, may change. But, you know, there's presumably going to be some some growth there that can take, you know, a little bit of the bite of inflation out or all of it, depending on what the product might be. Um, so, you know, that's always going to be something that you're going to want to include in the conversation, you know, especially for those folks who, who again, are in more of that risk wrap type of quadrant. Yeah. And just so in that context, like um it's more an argument of you have the step up opportunities and so forth. If mm -hmm. markets do well enough, you can increase the amount of income it provides, the protected income amount. Uh, it is hard to rely on that in most cases after retiring because market gains have to exceed your distributions and the fees to achieve new high watermarks that achieve uh, income increases. But like you were saying too, there are some that have riders that do have some sort of inflation adjustment included as well. And, and so it's definitely varies on a so, case by case basis. In, so in principle, to be clear on that, you're not saying that the variable annuity piece, it's not the market exposure for 
for like capital gains, that's going to uprun inflation because once you start digging distributions, you're not going to make those watermarks. It's more the riders that come with it that can provide that. Usually, tweet. yeah. Usually. usually right, yeah. Everything is caveated if, with. If markets do really yeah, well, usually. it could keep up with inflation, but yeah, you yeah, can't right. really expect that in advance. Exactly. <laughs> And, but then it's okay. ultimately still the same sort of story. It's it's not mm -hmm. that the annuity itself provides the inflation adjustment. It's just, can it make it easier for other assets to provide the inflation adjustment? Right. Okay. And so the next phase of this would be taking everyone through the RISA quadrants and showing how, you know, the, the underlying solution sets can potentially provide the right hedges. Is that correct, Bob? Absolutely. With this? Okay. Yeah. So Seeing we've, that we've talked the... about understanding what inflation was. We've done two episodes on the different tools that you can be using to deal with it. And now we're going to be talking about how to integrate those tools uh, into your plan, how to actually build this into a plan that, that works for you and you know how you approach retirement income. Perfect. Sounds like a plan. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you don't get inundated over the weekend with... Uh whatever hurricane what is it hurricane lee, lee is uh what hit two weeks ago when this comes out so okay well, nonetheless. <laughs> yes it's very much nonetheless. historical at this point <laughs> yeah yes all right all right all right everyone thanks Hopefully for listening we'll have another episode then <laughs> on another day thanks everyone go ahead alex no 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 after you <laughs> i just <laughs> There will be I insist, future good episodes man. of Retirement Style. And next we do need to explore the RISA quadrants to more specifically highlight how these different approaches and tools we've been talking about can fit in for different retirement income styles. So Excellent. thanks, Bob, for being on the show. I think at this point, for sure, Alex owes you a jacket because you've been a guest more than five times. So jacket? I don't know where that's at. <laughs> that's not in the budget, you know, like wait. On, on Saturday Night <laughs> Live, the budget. You gotta, <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's like the Paul yeah. Simon of retire with style. Yeah, as long as this is coming yeah, out of the recent budget, socks. I'm good. So I, I will say this, Bob, you, you didn't say a peep last time when we said goodbye. You were just there, the quiet man. Can you take us home to everyone? <laughs> sure. Show everyone, give us that enthusiasm. Give us that weight file enthusiasm <laughs> when you say goodbye. I don't know if I can do right? that quite do it, that do level. It. We believe in you, right, Wade? We believe. Give me your right. best shot. Absolutely. Give us your best exit. Come on. Well, thanks. Thanks, everyone, for your time here. Uh, we, we really appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to seeing you and, and concluding this conversation on inflation and, and managing it within your retirement plan next week. See you all later, yeah, everyone. Wade. That was pretty good, Wade. Wasn't it? He nailed it. That's a 10. Yeah. I, I almost <laughs> wish it was next week already. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everyone.